So I'll also sort of contextualize where we're at. Um, next week, the AUW, no, I mean the Lion students have fall break, correct? The next week, is that somebody give me, okay. Yes, and, yeah, yeah so, we have fall break. Okay, so next week, the AUW students, at least on the first day, will read their papers and um, I will record it in case the Lion students, I don't think, I can't require them to listen. It just so happens the papers come at this time. Um, and the advantage of that is the classes are small. And so when you present your paper, everybody listens, everybody asks questions. Um, if somebody does, well, maybe when we all get back together, I will summarize the papers and show how they are, you know, how they're related to each other. So I will do that. Anyway, so the next class, which will be a Monday for a uh, Sunday for AUW, will be reading your papers, giving a formal presentation. So come prepared. Um, all right. Uh, professor, I think we'll have our class on Monday and Wednesday. Yes, you do. And so next Monday, AUW students will present their papers. Doctor, okay. Mike, next okay. week students have their midterm. So normally we don't have class. No, wait. So yeah, I thought you had your midterms the following week. No, from we start our midterm from the third to the sixth. Oh, and I thought okay. Our class I thought, holds on like the fourth and the sixth. No, no, so. that's fine. I really thought your midterms were the following week. That's what I had down. Um, okay. No, if the midterms are the same week, that would be great. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm, we have the midterms the following week, I guess, and after that we have we have break fall break. No, no, no. We have class this week, then midterm starts this Sunday. Like, so this is like today's Wednesday, this Sunday midterm starts, which is the third and it starts. Yeah, so I'm also saying that it is the following week for us, right? So from Sunday to Wednesday, we have our midterms. Then after that, we will be on fall break. So basically uh, from the next week, we will have fall break. Then after that, we will get started with our formal classes again. All right, so instead of having a midterm exam, I'm gonna have you read your papers during the class hour, okay? I don't want you to take, you know, too long. Okay, professor. <laughs> yeah, so the equivalent of a midterm exam is just coming to class and reading your paper, okay? Do we have to come to class on Wednesday? Well, we'll see how how many, I don't, I don't think so, but we will see how, if we get through all of them. So what might happen is that students, some students don't show up on Monday. And so then we try to get them on Wednesday. Um, it's possible that it will take longer. I don't think so. Um, it's anyway, I wanna leave it open, but I don't wanna give you an extra reading, right? That would be, does that make sense, Rossi? So the reading of the papers and the talking about papers and all that stuff is the equivalent of the midterm exam. Is that fair? Since it is a writing seminar, that'll be what we'll focus on. Yes, okay. Professor, okay. that will work. So um, today we have the uh, Martin Luther King is the new reading, but I promised you that we would finish up with student comments on last time's reading. So everyone should be prepared, I warned you. Um, and this is how we're going to do it because the small groups just weren't working. And I mean, it's, that's how you learn, you know, how much, how much do I need to guide the students and how much can they do for themselves? So this is how I'm going to do it. Um, I'll summarize what we covered that I, I mean, 
you all were sitting here in class. I told you to write something down. I'm sure you have something. If you don't have something, that would be very strange. So I'll talk about that. And then I'll talk about the notes I took from the four, four people who already presented, Liam, Kasturi, Blaine, and Samantha. And then I will start calling on the rest of the students. Then I will start talk, talking about the Martin Luther King reading. And I will link it, show you how these things are linked. And they're all under the notion of practical wisdom, learning how to think like a citizen. Then each of you, again, will have to present to the whole group about your view. But while you're presenting, and it, I want everybody else to write one question or comment they would make to that person if that person turns out to be in their breakout session. So that when you get to your breakout sessions, each person is there. And when it's their turn, everybody else tells them what question or comment they had about what they said. Does everybody understand that? It just gives you more structure, more to go on. All right. So last time we talked about the, the virtue of a citizen. This is the second paper is concerned with political virtue. Now, this is supposedly what the West was supposed to contribute to international life, right? Is, uh, <clears throat> is uh, constitutional governments, free and open societies, free speech, free intellectual freedom, citizen engagement, so this is the foundation of all this stuff. Um, so it was odd when the history, US history professor said that we don't have a common set of values and virtues, and I think we definitely do, but whatever. Um, so we, we were talking about the particularly political virtues, which, oops, Political wouldn't, are, isn't just the lawmaking function, the people who make laws, but people who run a company also have to have laws and policies. So it's any kind of management or leadership. Now, the Greeks thought that greed was the number one political evil. It's, it's a personal vice, but it's the one that... Um, poisons political life because it's very easy if you're greedy for money to stick to money and then there's no middle class. So the art of statecraft is the art of weaving together the rich and poor to have a strong and stable middle class. It's done through laws. It's done through character, through imitation. If leaders exhibit this behavior and they inspire citizens to be that way, it's um, accomplished through knowing how to distribute uh, wealth, just social resources, social wealth, like education and healthcare. It isn't necessarily money. Um, how to punish wrongdoing so that the person can get back into society and become a productive member. How to apply the laws. Okay, and then practical wisdom is I mean, everyone can believe, can accept that in principle, but who is it that every day in every way makes the decisions that really do form a middle class? And then there are these other capacities, creating products that you sell, um, and also the intellectual virtues. This is what in general students associate with school is, um, the kind of learning that you come, you get a lecture, you get a test, math, science, things like that. But for a statecraft, sir, statesman, statecraft, um, you can um, hire experts who have some knowledge on something, but you hire them or you place them or you make them advisors to uh, advise 
this, the legislators, the lawmakers, about how to make certain laws. Like somebody was, um, they used the science knowledge they had to make opioids, right? Pain, pain killing drugs. Well, a good legislator would hire those people and say, what kind of laws do we need based on what you know about these drugs? So that's, all of that is the art of legislation. Um, so that's what I wanted you to um, comment on uh, in your countries, whatever. I gave that long paper on management and then I, we talked about change makers. How is the next generation gonna actually bring about the kind of adaptation that would promote human well-being? So the goal is still the same human well-being, not just my money or my power or my popularity or my well-being. It's everybody. You can't have your flourishing without helping others because you flourish literally by helping others. That's part of your own flourishing. So this is the, the new way to gain practical wisdom, the new set of tools you need, the new set of connections um, in order to make a society that's sustainable and that has a middle class and that we stop this bleeding of a very few rich people getting richer and richer. So, um, so that was what I was getting at last time. And Liam talked about um, the problem that we have, our political campaigns are based on marketing strategies, right? The people who develop a skill with the goal of selling a product and getting rich. So the whole skill has been corrupted by greed, but they use it unapologetically and they create political parties as if they're a product, a consumer product that you wanna buy. And of course you buy the thing that makes you look good or feel good. You don't even talk about policy. So that's a, a big problem in the US. And I'm curious to know if that's a problem in developing countries. Um, uh, so just hold on, you know, Poonam, I know you're here and I'll take attendance. So then Kasturi talked about um, in Nepal, the leaders started public health care and female education. Um, they were change makers. And she talked about the first royal families and um, Paima, anyway, she had a name. And so that was really good, a really good application. That's what I've been looking for in the students. And then Blaine talked about the very first step is self-control, right? And so that's why I like teaching college students. But actually that would be like, if somebody had the gift for teaching junior high kids or high school kids, because right when they get to the point there's a certain point, right? I have these kids in seventh grade, grandkids. Somewhere in there, you get this little voice that says, I don't have to do what my parents tell me to do, right? <laughs> I'm going to say no, just like a two-year-old. Um, but that's where you develop a sense of agency that you choose to do or to not do. And that's so important because your whole life really centers around your ability to be aware of your agency and then to try constantly to ask yourself, what do I want? What's possible in this situation? Practical wisdom, what are the options? What's my goal to flourish, for everyone to flourish? It's always the same goal. Um, what, is the, what is the choice? What are my options? Why is this choice serious? How can I make it in a way that would promote my overall goal? All of you are on the 70 year plan. So, so get used to it, okay? And so just that awareness is very important. Then Samantha was talking about finding the middle ground. And of course our country is very politically polarized and that's related to the fact that we have these um, marketing campaigns, right? We're running we're running our political society sort of like a sports event where you have your team, <laughs> your team loyalty or your product. Like I only buy Gap clothes 
And if somebody tells you, well, they cost more and the quality isn't better and they use slave labor, it doesn't matter. I'm a Gap girl, I buy Gap, doesn't matter, right? And I don't know if that's a problem in your countries. I'm curious about it, but I'm gonna leave it there and then I'm just gonna start calling on people in the order that I have them on my screen, okay? Um, so Rossi, what would you like to contribute? What what did you um, come up with? I, I have an example of a really good school in Cambodia that um, develop or like educate their high school students to become change agents. Two of AUW students are from that high school. Um, it's called Liger Leadership Academy and their curriculum is different because they are a project-based curriculum where students go into their own community. They identify the problems that are within that community and they find practical and like, uh, practical solutions so that the, city, uh, the the people in those villages are able to like implement it and solve those issues and one great example of a project that my best friend did was CubeSat. CubeSat is the first Cambodian um, satellite to be launched and by the end of 2021 and the aim of CubeSat is to provide internet access to rural students in Cambodia so that they're able to do like more research and stuff. Okay, so what is the what is the name of that academy? How do you spell it? Liger Leadership Academy. I'm writing it. Okay, good. Um, L I G E R. Okay, that's that is great. Um, and two of the students are from there. So. Who are they? Two of um, Savanari Hrit and Ho Samnang, you might meet them. Okay. Or like the next, the, uh, like re next writing seminar. Okay, good. I hope so. Um, Can you shake anyway. the chat box? Shanaz, what? Can you please shake the chat box, please? I, I didn't hear you. Can you, sh can you please what? Check the chat box. Oh, sure. Um, okay. Okay, sure, Shanaz, that's fine. Um, do you want to comment? You have nine minutes left. Do you want to comment? Yes, sir. Uh, I don't want to come today, so I just. Um, I mean, I'm just asking to the, all the professors to excuse me today because it's very important for me. And uh, I just attend because uh, I don't want to send you mail. I want to tell you in the class. Uh, I want to tell you in the class, so I just mentioned it here. Did you have a, did you, I mean, if you have nine minutes left, did you want yes. to present, you know, talk about what it is you came to class with last time? Uh, actually, Professor, can I, Tell next time because I don't have much time. That's why. Right. Okay. All right. So okay. we'll go to the next person then. Um, let's see. Um, Alexis is next. So um, I want to. There was a comment made last time about knowing what legislation is important to you as an active voter and as you know someone who's really interested in political science I spend a lot of time thinking about legislation that's important to me uh, for example the stuff that's going on in Texas right now um, regarding abortion I think th there's something so important right now about being being an educated voter, I had a conversation with someone today who said they don't care about politics and this was a um, <laughs> middle class white man <laughs> i'm just gonna say that so i uh, it was and this conversation was specifically relating to the stuff going on in texas and he said he didn't know what was going on and that is just so frustrating because it's people it's people like that who aren't taking the time to educate themselves on politics and being involved in these issues is why what's going on in texas is going on right now and that's just really infuriating well, there are other things too, like the voter suppression laws and the yeah. the secretaries of state. The that's big, okay. <laughs> that the ones that are up for re-election and they're getting primaried out, and 
this is it is really important and yeah alexis it's very disappointing um anyway uh do you think we can have a democracy when the citizens are not informed no definitely not there's there's no point in having any sort of conversation with these people who refuse to educate themselves on these issues and so they have really nothing to contribute when it comes to voting and a lot of people when they're in that situation refrain from voting or what do they vote on the basis of their brand yeah they, they may they make like very wrong decisions because they yeah it's it's bad okay alexis i have a question do you think spiritually and the greek view of spirit living for the sake of something greater than yourself justice or truth do you think spiritually we're a democracy do you think the majority of our people want justice i think that a lot of people make their voting decisions based on a concept of individualism doing what's best for them and not best for the population as a whole so i would say no we are not living okay i mean virtually right i do think you should think about that right the way our system is set up officially legally what's going on with the spirit of the times because that's what happened in Athens, exactly. Remember, I don't know if you remember, but they had it all set up really well, but then the, the people were corrupt and they destroyed it. So I think you should think about that um, without polarizing. I think people on either side of the spectrum would agree in theory about this. I, they might, right? And then the next thing is, well, let's go into the particulars, right? So. Um, I hope I, does that make sense to you, Alexis? Yeah, it does. Okay, good. Um, Aiden. Hey, Dr. Beck, can you hear me? Yes. So I wanna talk about um, just, I wrote a little bit about it in my paper, but with all the virtues, um, it talks about how it's good to be virtuous and everything, but it doesn't talk about the difficulty of it and it's a lot more difficult to be virtuous during uh dark times during tough times and uh, specifically magnanimity um when you're trying to be giving it's a lot easier to be giving if you're rich or if you have things right but um when you're broke or if it's a dark time it's hard to do that but it's still important to even if you're not giving physical things um just through that would be generous magnanimous is if you're rich generous is if you're just kind of like us <laughs> Right. Yes, ma'am. Um, yeah, but it doesn't talk about that, but um, I think it's important to think about. Not only that, Aiden, but when we read this, because we tend to be post-enlightenment types, uh, that's not what Aristotle meant. He wrote, he had the big chunk of his book is about ignorance, how people make mistakes, right? right. They have good intentions, but they didn't know enough, or they had a character flaw, or, you know, right? Yes, ma'am. And so we do have to remember that too, that um, there's a lot of ways you can go wrong when you think you have good reasons. Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am, it does. Yeah, so it's really hard. It's hard even when people don't even think it's hard. <laughs> it's hard. Um, good. Okay, Jamie, and everybody else needs to write down, you know, what would I ask that person if they're in my breakout group, right? Um, all right, Jamie, what do you have? Jamie? Okay. Uh, Shamima? Yes, Professor. Okay, what do you have? Yes, Professor, I want to talk about the the shen shen smoker as in the reading it mentioned like everyone is a shen smoker as we know we went to the school to learn to trade or to get some skill right professor like to like to, to get some skill and to know like to about the knowledge or everything to change the world like to do something for our community or something like for our country and I, I want to talk about something in the reading, which is mentioned especially, like it said, 
a kid has had an idea, build a team, and change her, her world, like her country. That's really true. But because, as you know, Professor, in our country, if we want to develop, like if we want to change our country, we have passed the priorities, the freedoms, and the right. And if we have those things, we can change, like, for example, if we have, like, the freedoms, we can go to the the school we can go to the university we can go everywhere like if we want to develop our country but without those things we will not be able to do anything as you know professor we don't have like those kind of opportunities like about about due to the circumstance we don't have those things but after coming in bangladesh we are regretting like how like how those things are important how citizenship is really important. But I hope like after graduating from a UW, we, I can be a chance marker for my country. But when I was in Myanmar, I don't think that I, I can do something for my country. Okay, so I just want to remind people that Shamima is a Rohingya Muslim who is in the refugee camp in Bangladesh. So, um, it's true, you had no rights, nothing in Myanmar. Now that you're in Bangladesh, you've had this opportunity. Are there a lot of other Rohingyas who are able to get an education, to get to go to colleges? Are, there, are they really trying to nurture a certain 10% or a certain percent that can be the future change makers and leaders? As you know, Professor, like we ha we can go to the school like the basic class four and class five. After that, everything is done up. Like for example, if you want to get higher education, like university level, or if you want to do some job, like with governments, and there is no right for you because you don't have even one ID card. How it could be possible to do like those things? Even we don't have a still any ID card and national ID card. So it's not for us, especially it's not for us. Well, are there things, obviously donors, the AUW donors, so magnanimity, rich folk and NGOs and governments, are they coming in there to try and take the, the top 10% and get them educated, like your experience? Sorry, Professor, can you please repeat that? Yeah, I mean, you, you managed to get an education, higher ed, right? Yes. Why? Because these rich donors have made it possible and you don't have the ID, whatever. So are there, yeah. are there a certain percentage of Rohingya Muslims that are getting the same kind of things that you're getting from donors or NGOs or or other governments or the Bangladesh government? Are they getting jobs? Are they getting <laughs> college education? Professor, as you know, if you want to, if you would like to attend the university, you may have some educational level and some education experience. Like for example, I got a scholarship from a UW because when I was in Myanmar, I passed like class 10 matriculation exam. That's why I got the scholarship. But in our Rohingya society, the most of the majority of girls will not ever like, they didn't go to the school because they don't have those kind of chance. So like that's all. But in Bangladesh, in the Rohingya refugee camp, people are some doing job as a voluntary. It knows like the professionally, like they just doing some job as a voluntary. It was like parties. They are doing like this thing. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, they, it is the change maker article does presuppose a whole lot of advantages and privileges, right? You have access to computers for some one thing. Yes, right? Professor, when I read this article, it's like totally related, like our personal life. And I can compare everything by reading this article. Okay, good. Very good. Um, Thomas. Thomas? 
I'm here. I'm sorry. I'm here. I'm sorry. I'm here. So, um, last class, you kind of uh, discussed what it meant to be a selfless citizen. And um, I was thinking about that. And what really got me thinking was when Liam was talking about how being a selfless politician is very hard when being a politician is centered around marketing, especially in the U.S., and that also got me thinking about how it is near impossible to be a selfless citizen and think about your fellow citizens whenever, especially in the U.S., in order to be a politician, in order to put yourself in the political sphere, you need an ungodly amount of money, an insane amount of money to run just in the first place. You know, even at local levels, you already have to have some form of capital built up in order to campaign correctly. So when you get to the higher kind of, you know, higher tiers of our legislator it's impossible to get there without almost selling yourself and selling your message out to large donors large you know um, you know political corporations that basically buy your influence so I, I think that what you talked about how spiritually our country is no longer a democracy I feel like that's invaded our our literal democracy in our politics especially in the U.S. I'm not sure how it is in uh, developing countries but I feel like our political sphere has turned into like a market where you can buy out votes and kind of influence things indirectly. So that's just kind of what I thought. Yeah. The other thing, though, is I think there's at least two sets of billionaires and they have two very different goals. And so the politicians can get money from rich people, but for very, very different reasons. Right. They're looking for something very different in a politician. Um, so I do think you should keep track. I mean, I don't like it when students say, well, they're all the same. They're not the same. Um, and then the other thing to ask is there, there was, there's one person, political leader, she, and she said that she always asks candidates, could you get another job? Could you get a really good other job, even that makes more money. In other words, you have to you have to poke them and see what their motive is. Because if their only alternative is to have a job that was way way less status, money, or power, then they're going to be more of a pup. They'll do whatever their donors say. But if it's somebody that has their own resources, then they can afford to, you know, speak out and get lose the next election, for example. And it's not going to destroy their career or their ego or whatever. Do you think that's important, Thomas? I would definitely say so. I had thought of that, to be honest. Um, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, I can definitely see the importance. You should look at the backgrounds, right? I mean, I know a guy who was the majority whip in the house. And before that, he was selling fertilizer or something like that, okay? So he was put in as a puppet by the rich because they knew he would do whatever. He ended up actually <laughs> getting in trouble with the law in Texas for... Um, I, it was some kind of illegal ger gerrymandering. <laughs> you know, it was illegal gerrymandering before gerrymandering became like a, the norm. I'm not sure. But anyway, I'm glad. I'm glad that you think it, it's worth bringing up. I think it's worth bringing up. Um, Untari, what do you think? What did you come up with? Um, professor, actually, like, I'm sorry, because like, I think I read the wrong reading materials because I thought today was 6 October and last class was 4 October. So I don't I don't know what we are talking about right now, but I, I okay. think I know. No, today is not the 4th of October. <laughs> it's, today is September still. Right? Yeah, that's why. Okay. <laughs> I'm I, confused I what you guys are talking about I'm today. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought this week was like the last week, just like on time. Yeah, and that's why I read the... It was like the presentation and then like when I joined it and they were like talking about like 
change agents and stuff. I was like, what was this class about? Yeah. It was the last class. We're still catching up from last time. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, but I do pretty carefully put the date on the stream. You know, yeah. and, that, and that's not easy because Lion is a different date. So I do try. Um, every once in a while, you might get one that's the day before and you have to go, uh oh, she didn't change from the Lion. But I, yeah, make sure you read the stream and it should right up there say the date. Okay, Untari? Uh, um, yes, Professor. I'm sorry. Okay, so Shandi, uh, San, Shanjida, San. Sanit, no, Sanjida. Hello, Professor. Hello. Um, Professor, I'm sorry, I missed last class and I don't have any comment. Okay, okay, Poonam. Hey, yes, Professor, I also missed the last class. Okay, um, Haley. Um, in the readings last week, or? Last, for last class, um, there was a quote that said, social transformation flows from personal transformation. And um, I related that to if we as Americans were more of a coll uh, collectivistic culture rather than an individualistic, oh my goodness, individualistic culture, we would, uh, we would be able to realize our impact on society and be more likely to be change makers. But I think we're more concerned about ourselves than we are about our peers. And that goes into politics as well. Okay, I'll tell you the irony, which I think the guy who wrote the article about the US. On the one hand, you came to America to pull yourself up by the bootstraps, right? To make something of yourself, blah, blah. And that's rugged individualism. On the other hand, you're in a democracy. And in order to be to preserve it, you have to think like a citizen. So right at the root of our society was a contradiction. Does that seem fair, Haley? No. <laughs> okay, and we still live with it. That's the other thing. That's why reading history in the sense of the history of ideas, what people were thinking, that's why it's still really important. Uh, because people still think these same ways. And again, this is what's interesting, like Rossi or Kasturi or, you know, the, the Shanjida, Shamima, Muntari. You can compare what we're talking about with America and say, well, what, how does that compare to our country, right? Um, so, you know, Untari, as far as I know from Indonesia, it was more collectivist at the beginning. I think the USA sort of stands out in terms of its rugged individualism because, you know, people traveled all, uh, all the way across an ocean and they thought they had this complete <laughs> frontier and they just, you know, committed a little genocide here and there and it was all good. Um, but that sort of allowed for more individualism than most other countries. But anyway, so my impression from the um, Panchasila Declaration of Independence was that it was much more Aristotelian and much more collective oriented right from the beginning. Does that make sense to you, Untari? Yeah, Professor. Okay, those are just things to think about. Also, well, anyway, um, let's see. Uh, Shraboni. Um, nothing. Uh, Nimra. Yes, Professor. What did you come with last time? Uh, actually, I had an airport issue in last class, but I want to talk about the democracy of Bangladesh in my country. Okay. Uh, though it's called our country is democratic country, but I don't think it is democratic country because of uh, <laughs> we have a lot of issue in our country. Mm, 
here is the political pe people who are political leader they get the more, more opportunity in every sector even if we apply for the job yeah, for example if i am the more qualified than other and if others have the uh, political power they got the opportunity in uh, health sector as well uh, if we go for the treatment if the we have the political power and the, they get the better treatment in every sector we we face the discrimination about that yeah okay so you you so the political leaders use their power to help their friends yeah friends family relatives yeah so there's kind of an upper crust yeah um, yeah and bangladesh uh, we have the uh, two government like one is called awami league one is called bmp and the now government is the awami league party and the opposite one get the uh, actually more discriminate uh, they can't talk against the uh, government if they talk anything against the government and they get arrested okay so any kind of dissenters are uh, punished yes are they just and okay they arrest and uh, they keep there in the jail are they imprisoned or are they just not given jobs or they lose jobs sorry i didn't get are they put in prison or are yes, they yes. okay they put in the prison okay are there other things that happen like they lose the jobs they have or they they don't get yes. hired yeah okay. yes in our country uh, like the <laughs> who are not booted for the uh, uh, recent government we have the uh, government our big leader and um, if we not booted for them and um, we don't get the job if we even qualify okay okay they verified they verified and uh, we and uh, they uh, send this verification and they check everything even uh, booted for home and uh, uh, what background they have and they have uh, mm, <laughs> not even they don't follow the rules of the government and they can hear or not the government everything they check well, and then they, if if they see they are not the people of the government they are not booted for them and mm, they don't give the job so every do you let's see does everybody know who everybody voted for yes they know because of the uh, see there is a, a level political level from the our union and the jela uh, upazila and the district okay okay so, so if i not directly voted for the government and the uh, uh, who are voted for the government they know obviously yeah that's bad. <laughs> who we, we follow yeah not good um i do think it's good to know because for somebody like me it doesn't follow these things closely you know that according to the un right these are the democracies that have elections and these are the ones that don't and of course <laughs> it's a lot yeah. more complicated than that with the example of the united states and the last election there is the two, uh, two government like the joe biden and the uh, last one okay government who was the donald trump and if uh, someone vote for the donald trump and the uh, uh, who vote for the joe biden they don't uh, give any opportunity like this in bangladesh happen yeah okay okay i get it all right 
Now, so that was that article. Now we're going to go to Martin Luther King. So this is what this is why I assigned them the way I did, is that um, another cornerstone for a democratic society is that the citizens can publicly criticize, question the political leaders, and they can have nonviolent demonstrations. They can publicly let, let everybody them. know that they disagree with something the political leaders are doing. And they have a right to do that. That's free speech. As long as they're not violent, right? Violence, you know, is against the law. But that's why I think nonviolent demonstrations are critical to, to I mean, they're necessary, they're necessary to have a democracy, but people really should participate in these, um, especially in a really important times, right? So ever since I was in high school, um, it's very important not to have too many of these because people then can't get off work and they can't come. But every once in a while, you've got to have them. And if there is a national wide demonstration and you agree, you need to get your derriere down there somewhere. Because I know this ever since 10th grade, okay? <laughs> because the person you disagree with, in this case, Richard Nixon, if you weren't there, he would think, he would claim that everybody who didn't go agreed with him. That's how they maintain their power. So um, it is very important to do this. And so even people in developing countries, and I, when I was in Indonesia, I was asked to talk about, actually, they knew about Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement. And they knew, yeah, it was amazing. So I just told them, you know, I have a whole history of doing these things. And I think they're really important. Um, so it started out, my dad, I think I told you, my dad marched with Martin Luther King when I was in fifth grade. And he, um, he met him. Um, and so we started marches. There were marches in my town. And I was, you know, junior high or something. And then the Vietnam War cranked up. And so the, the ministers in our town, the people who were against the war in my town were the mayor of the town, the president of the college, the nuns and priests at the monastery. All these very prominent people were demonstrating against our government. And that's, that's democracy, right? Even when it was, okay, Nixon was Republican, but actually before that, the president that got us into Vietnam was a, a Democrat and they demonstrated against him. So it really didn't matter. It was the policy that mattered. Um, and the reason they disagreed, it was America was becoming imperialistic. It was getting to be a power grab. Um, so I, I encourage you, I know that in Indonesia, what I had read about is students, you know, demonstrate. Um, they don't always stay nonviolent, I don't think. But especially college students are at that time when they're aware of their own agency, like I said, or like one of the students said, uh, Blaine. And that's when you have to decide, am I going to get my derriere there or not? And if you agree with it and you value democracy, uh, you better. <laughs> the next time it happens, the voice of Dr. Beck should be saying, eh, you get there. Um, so anyway, I demonstrated um, civ what was civil rights, the war, environmental protection. And then it was, you know, South, uh, South Africa, all over the years, just, many, many things. Um, women's, women's stuff was more recently. But anyway, so I think it's a very important tradition. 
And I think all of you should take it very seriously. The other thing about it that was very discouraging, and this was when I was in college, I went to a really good college, like the top 12 liberal arts schools in the country. And it was a liberal college and the kids, the students were all demonstrating against the war. But if you ask them why, they had really bad reasons. And that's why I like the Greeks. You have to do it for the right reason. And you have to do it in the right way, which is nonviolently. You have to do it at the right time. You have to do it toward the right person. All of that stuff matters because there were a number of people demonstrating just for selfish reasons. They didn't want to get drafted. That's not a reason. You know, it should be because it was an unjust war. We were massacring people. We were, our policies were terrible. Our motives were terrible. Um, I mean, I could give you a long list. I had read a number of books about it. I was informed about it. The military industrial complex, corporations were making money off of these wars and they were keeping them going to make their money and their children were not drafted. Anyway, so um, it's very important that you are informed and that you have good reasons and that you distinguish between just war and unjust war or you distinguish between, you might actually think a certain war is just, but there's a certain massacre that goes on and you demonstrate against excess brutality, right? It's just very important to keep making distinctions and to keep getting out there in the public eye when you disagree. Now, what happened after 9-11 is that there was a very deliberate forming, a reformation, a reforming, of a political rhetoric that deliberately created a story about Christianity that made it an empire kind of religion standard. You know, when you have a, a right wing authoritarian government, you always bring in the church and the church is on your side. And so so, you know, I used to hear people say, you know, politicians are not supposed to talk about God. Our founding fathers said, no way, Jose, you'll lose your democracy. Don't ever listen to a politician who talks about God. Well, after 9-11, that was definitely not what happened. We went the other way. And it's very important that students know that. Not just American students, that's, you know, when your politicians start talking about God, you're in trouble. It's going to become authoritarian. So be careful about that. But the other thing that is very important about this letter is that his techniques about how to set up nonviolent, it was a four step process. This, um, this letter is a classic. It's going to last forever, I think for two reasons, partly because this technique about setting up nonviolent, how to train the people is used over and over again, because this is just the best model. So it was used uh, during the gay rights era. There was gay right demonstrations. There was a time when no money was put into funding for AIDS drugs. Uh, because, you know, people wanted gay people to die, right? Or they thought it was God's will. They did. I know that. Um, and so there were demonstrations to get um, funding to do research about AIDS and find some way to, you know, address it. And they used, there's books about that. They used Martin Luther King's letter and his techniques for their demonstrations. There were demonstrations during the, after the USSR fell in the um, Eastern Europe and Yugoslavia, there was a huge massacre there and there were nonviolent demonstrations and they used the same techniques. In South Africa with uh, Nelson Mandela, he used it 
And I, I'm sure that all of you like, I didn't follow Southeast Asia during those years, but that's why I want to learn. You know, I really want to learn from those uh, AUW students about your own country's history of this. But I also want you to start, right? You're a generation that should be alert. You should know that this is a very important tool and technique for developing a democracy and for preserving a democracy. And it's very important that they stay nonviolent. And it's very difficult that they do because what happened to Martin Luther King happened with Black Lives Matter, right? So Black Lives Matter triggered the whole thing and it became international. So I think AUW students, right? You probably have right at the forefront of your mind, some example, because everything, you know, it's amazing. But what I, you know, the thing, I think it's my job as a teacher to give you this historical documents and these historical perspectives. And, and to explain that these are the sort of basic principles. So there's two things that probably won't change. One of them is the techniques. And the other one is um, the notion of um, justice by nature, that there are natural laws or natural justice that every country is accountable. No political leader gets to define justice. And, and that means every citizen in a free and open society has the responsibility to ask, what is justice by nature? What are the natural laws? And are my leaders abiding by them? And if not, why not? So these are really important things that every citizen in any country that wants to be more democratic or doesn't want to lose their democracy, really needs to think about and, and read about and talk to other people about. Um, so let me go to the outlines here for a sec. And again, I assume that a lot of you already brought things to comment on. So I hate to take your time, but we're going to try this method and see if this works. Um, so here is, um, he was called an outsider. So this was true. My dad marched in Selma, but it was the same stuff, right? So um, people would, there are no outsiders. And so when Black Lives Matter happened, the same things happened. People were saying, these are outsiders coming in, you know? And then these African-Americans would get interviewed on the, the, the news shows that I would watch. They said, Martin Luther King said that, you know? And um, you deplore the demonstrations, but not the conditions. Another thing that happened that's very important is that people who do not want the demonstrations to be successful, they incite violence. So what was true in the 60s was also true a couple of years ago on Black Lives Matter. There were off-duty FBI, CIA police officers who were inciting, trying, they were parading, you know, disguised as demonstrators, but they were trying to get people to be violent so that it would discredit the movement. And so again, with now that we have YouTube and we have, we used to have just anecdotal evidence. People would say, well, I saw somebody being violent, but now we have these little clips. Well, a, a Princeton professor did research and according to his research, and again, that was uh, after a number of months, um, it was 93% nonviolent. So that's where you can't just believe your eyes and you can't just allow your trigger reactions, fear or pleasure. You can't allow your emotions or your eyeballs to decide whether this is nonviolent or not because you, got, you have to go to the research. You have to go to statistics. What percentage of the people who are actually been counted all over the country 
as demonstrating. And what percentage, what number is, is becoming violent and what's the percent? That is really important. Um, then the next thing is there always are some people who will take advantage, who will loot stores, for example. That is that, you know, you can't, there are people against abortion that will shoot, you know, uh, uh, people who work in abortion clinics, but there are nut cases. There are always the extreme behaviors. That does not delegitimize the issue. So you've got to always stay on the issue. And especially if you've been trained in liberal arts, and of course, especially if you've been trained in philosophy, but you have to stick to the principles. And I did that. I remember doing that in high school long before I ever read a philosophy book. Um, I just kept thinking these people are in it for the wrong reason. And so they were narcissistic. Some of them were just self-absorbed. Um, they were cowards. They didn't believe in, in anyway. So when I moved to uh, the South, that is the stereotype in their head, is that the 60s people who were against the war were narcissists and unpatriotic and atheists. It's like, wait a sec. Um, so, you know, for me, it was American imperialism. Are we going to really make good on our claim that we were going to try to, to um, make to make the world more democratic, to have a balance of powers amidst the countries? And, um, or are we just gonna get into a power struggle? Are we gonna build an empire and, you know, and demonize the communists or, you know? So we'll see what, um, what you think or what happens as we move forward. As we move forward, we're going to have this bipolar world with China and the US, but there's gonna be other stuff coming in. It's just that you will have to think about political rhetoric. In my country that demonizes China, is it accurate or not? Um, I know that in Southeast Asia, they have issues with China and that's even more interesting. I think all of this stuff is really interesting. Uh, but please try to be informed and try to avoid emotional uh, rhetoric or reactions. Try to find out the facts. Try to find out the research. Um, it's difficult, but it's important. Um, so here's the four steps for a nonviolent campaign. Fact gathering, right? What are the facts? And then you have to Negotiate, remember, that was a big thing in the Greek. First, diplomacy. Diplomacy and intelligence first. And military is if you have failed diplomacy. Um, then you try to, you have to make sure that you don't overreact. The self-purification is for, first of all, not overreacting. And second of all, not even reacting in a natural way, right? So when somebody um, beats you, you don't resist, right? Because you've got to make this point and you can't you know, let any uh, people who want to defend the status quo, do you see they fought back? You see the police had a reason to have to you know, get tough. Um, so you have to self-purify. You have to not react in a way that would be natural. Um, and then you have to um, act directly. They postponed it. They tried again, right? He had a lot of evidence that negotiation is the goal and this is the only way to get there. Um, they get accused of being willing to break laws. It's not true. They're pointing out that the Jim Crow laws, the segregation laws are illegal. There's nothing in the Jim Crow laws that says racism. <laughs> it's just that they make it, uh, it just turns out that way. And that's happening right now in these um, voter, voter laws. There's nothing in it that talks about race. It's just that, <laughs> it's just that it's calculated 
so that people who are not white, every they know how they vote, when they vote, where they vote, and they they create laws that will make it more difficult for those people in those locations or in those ways of voting or um, so it's very much like the Jim Crow laws in that sense. Um, we have a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. That means our political leaders are corrupt in the laws that they make or the way they enforce them. Okay, so there is a higher law or a higher standard. And this is just an old, old Western tradition. It, it was, and I think it goes way back to other cultures too, but we're just gonna go with this one now. Um, in unjust, the powerful force the powerless to obey, but they don't obey. That's rule for the sake of the rulers, not for the ruled, right? Um, okay, so rule for the sake of the rulers is another short way to say it, but this is more sophisticated. Um, you can have a law that's just on the surface, but not in application. Do you remember, this is exactly out of that Aristotle. There was the art of legislation, the art of punishment of wrongdoing, and then equity was the, the ability to take a law and apply it justly, right? This is like straight out of that. And Martin Luther King has read Aristotle, but even if he didn't, it's common sense. These are patterns. You can figure them out without ever reading, reading Aristotle, but he actually did. So I'm sure, you know, he just didn't want to quote Aristotle for obvious reasons. Um, okay, and then he is very annoyed at people who have, you know, are moderate and they're, you know, I'm on your side. This happens happened during um, Black Lives Matter too. And I mean, I'm somewhat guilty of it, right? I'm, I'm with them, you know? I mean, I'm in favor of stuff, but I don't, I'm not as involved as I could be, should be, whatever. Um, but I, I do agree with it and I do what I can. So these white moderates were critical of Martin Luther King. They said, well, you're going too fast. That's, you've got to get over that. That's, it's always too fast because people, there's plenty of people that will resist change. So there is a time when the change, I, there is, we've got to change to a sustainable society, right? And that's going to be big changes and they have to come. They will come not only in your lifetime, but they will come within the next 10 years. So there probably will be violence, um, at least in my country. So I do want you to sort of think about it before it just comes upon you. Um, people are called extreme. Martin Luther King was called extreme when um, he just didn't want to be complacent anymore. There are African-Americans who became successful and then they said, well, I don't have any trouble with the system or I'm too busy or... <laughs> And then there are there at, were and are African Americans and others who are so frustrated and they get violent. Um, so you have to find the middle ground. And uh, there's a whole history of prophets. So the church is a social institution. So uh, Martin Luther King is very much against churches as social clubs and definitely this is a big problem. Um, people are more segregated by race, class, and gender on Sunday morning. And now it's gotten to the point where they're more segregated by which side of a polarized public they're on. And this is really, this is really a problem because people used to go to church and put aside their political leanings and the preacher wasn't supposed to talk about it. There was um, a Frenchman who studied the US. He came over during the enlightenment 
And he assumed religion would be very weak force because it had caused so many problems in Europe. And, and America was supposed to be based on the enlightenment and knowledge and the future and progress. And he gets here and everybody goes to church. It was a total shock to him. But his conclusion was the reason the churches were alive and played a big role in people's lives is because they didn't say anything about politics. They stayed completely out of politics. And we just have about the reverse now. We have preachers who are very politicized. And um, that is a big problem because that um, you shouldn't let politicians, you shouldn't think one political party is more religious than another. It's very dangerous. Um, Here's one thing about the prophet, the tradition of the prophets in the Bible. This would be of interest to Muslims because a lot of these same people are in the Quran. And that is so interesting to me. And um, of course the difference, one of the differences between Islam and Christianity is that the Muslims think Jesus was another prophet and that's fine. He just wasn't the Messiah. And I don't think it's worth killing people over, frankly. But, uh, you know, Jesus could have been a prophet and Muhammad could have been a prophet. Um, and then the Muslims say he's the seal of the prophet. They're not going to be any more prophets. <laughs> like, eh. uh, I think you should worry about how you live personally. But anyway, so we have all these people cutting edge, exposing corruption. Socrates was a kind of prophet, Amos, um, Jesus. Um, so this is an outline about the whole tradition, the tradition of nonviolent resistance, the Gandhi, we're gonna talk about Gandhi when it comes to Hinduism, Socrates, and he accepted, right? He didn't run away. Uh, just like Martin Luther King let himself get arrested, didn't go underground. Um, because he he's not against the laws per se. He was against the Jim Crow laws because they contradicted the Supreme Court, the federal laws. Um, anyway, the uh, Aristotle and segregation, Seneca, Augustine. So we have this long tradition. Now, Islam also has a long intellectual tradition of natural law. So if any of the Muslim students want to ever study that, it's a really fascinating um, study. And I have a few materials on that. Um, the old law was the law of Moses, 10 commandments. The new law is you write it in your heart. You have um, purity of heart. And then the letter follows that old tradition. Um, okay, and then this one other thing, there's some themes. Okay, I gave this little speech on Martin Luther King Day, but here's just a pattern. Uh, each paragraph has some patterns. It was his struggle with organized religion is, is supporting the status quo. So you can think, think about this in your own countries, in your own lives, in your own, you know, histories. He was a radical conservative to some extent because he really did think freedom and equality were worthwhile. And now he wants America to actually live, live up to its principles. But um, America's founders were progressives, right? <laughs> so we have this reversal where people um, don't like, they reject Black Lives Matter in the name of patriotism and conservatism. And it's actually exactly the reverse. Um, even though he was conservative, he was labeled a liberal extremist. Um, we have a natural capacity to recognize truth. So every time a little girl is born or someone in a non-white race is born, they that little kid can figure out I'm not stupider than the white boys, and I'm not less moral. I'm not more wicked than the white boys. They figure it out because it's intuitively obvious. And so 
you're never going to be able to maintain an unjust society. Uh, liberal arts education is designed to cultivate the capacity to identify these patterns and to use them in your life. And he compares it to Socrates. And I really think, I mean, we read Socrates, right? You should think about this. Socrates thought it was necessary to create a tension so that individuals could rise above myths and half-truths and habits, and they could constantly, right? He knows about the Socratic gadfly to create a tension, right? People are always questioning, examining, re-examining, and acting. That's the only way to keep your society honest and democratic. He unified reason and faith, science and religion. And so, um, so I think all of those are important. Um, and, and those are an important part of practical wisdom. And it's part of the Western intellectual tradition, but it's part of really, I'm sure Hindu, Muslim, it's not exclusively Western. So I'm going to have everybody react. And I want all of you to listen to each person and write down, if they're in my breakout group, what I'm going to ask them. And if we run out of time, um, I, want, I don't want you to forget it. I actually have run out of time. Put it in your post, OK? All right, Liam, what you got? Okay, um, so I, of course, as always, get sidetracked by the political act aspect, but I'm gonna go on a slight tangent and be like, yo, Martin Luther King's cool for obvious reasons and his like efforts through uh, nonviolent action are very relevant still today, but are also seen in actions like Socrates because drawing parallels is fun. And Socrates went through the legal court system. He went through everything and he was like, look, I'm gonna do things normally. I can't be corrupt. I can't do the bad things like run away. Like Credo tells me, he just goes with his uh, own values and principles. And even though he does wind up, you know, eating the forbidden snacks, uh, he, he sticks with his will, which is good. Like Martin Luther King and they are both they end up in very different places, I guess you could say, as far as their goals go, uh, but they both achieve great things, which is cool. I'm not sure if that really answers any questions. That well, I'm how about the image of the gadfly? Does that make sense as something that every American should understand? If I'm um, a good citizen, I should be a gadfly. Yes, yes, because the annoying and riling up the horse I think it was horses, riling up the horse um, and, and keeping it awake. I have it in my notes. Uh, yeah, doing, doing what he is supposed to be doing. And when we're polarized, it means people have stopped thinking they're fixated on something. Yeah. Yeah. They're still active and angry, but not participating in the, I guess, life cycle, if you will. Any give and take, right? It's just, I know this is right, and I'm going to ramrod it through. Well, that's the end. Um, okay. Rossi. Um, I want to comment on one of uh, King's saying in, the, in his letter that nonviolent direct action seeks to create a crisis and foster such a tension that a community which has constantly refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. I have kind of like the perfect example for that. It's um, there are two sisters from ba Bali in Indonesia, um, Malati and Isabel Richson. Um, they are known as um, Indonesian climate activists who put in the effort to reduce plastic consumption in Bali. And when they were, when Malati was 12 and Isabel was only 10, they had a non, they went on a nonviolent approach to get people's attention and raise awareness about plastic bag usage. And they went on a hunger strike to get the, uh, the Bali's government attention so that um, the government 
put barley as a plastic bag free island and they also um, use Facebook to stir up attention and get support or get international support and this just proved that with just enough effort and determination and using the right method like nothing can stop them from achieving their goals. How old were they? Um, when they started, the older sister, Malati, was 12, and the younger one, Isabel, was 10. Okay, those are the change maker, right? That's a class. Yes. Case. Okay. All right, very good. Um, Kasturi. Uh, yes. So, Professor, uh, I think that I could uh, relate more to the nonviolent campaign, uh, the four strategies mentioned in the letter, because uh, I, I don't know why, but then I find it really uh, tough to understand the history of my own country. Uh, so uh, there are a lot of um, treaties signed by Nepal government with other governments as well. Uh, so um, uh, still now there are a lot of, lot of parts of Nepal that have been colonized by India. So a few days back, uh, so um, there was a talk about uh, talk regarding uh, Indian government taking uh, the particular part of Nepal uh, called uh, Kalapani. So uh, uh, actually, we don't have a very strong border between Nepal and India, and uh, 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 I, I don't know whether it is true or not, but then I have heard that uh, many uh, many Indians, they just uh, remove the uh, sign of the border from place to place and they claim some parts of Nepal as their own place. So uh, uh, when I went through a uh, history of Nepal, when I was in my school level, uh, I went through a lot of uh, treaties signed by Nepal. So in some of the uh, treaties, uh, I could uh, find I could find that uh, even though Nepal was uh, not provided with justice uh, in many regions, in many uh, cases, uh, Nepal government it decided to sign the treaty, being uh, very silent. You know, like uh, we don't want any war more. So uh, we just uh, we will just sign the treaty. That's all. There is one uh, treaty called the uh, uh, Peace Treaty, which is called Sugauli Sandi in Nepal. So um, uh, uh, politicians uh, they didn't want uh, the citizens to go under uh, problems a lot, or they wanted uh, their country to be uh, free, liberal. So uh, they, uh, I know that they identified uh, w whether uh, they were under injustice or not. They took the negotiation part as well, and they actually uh, undertook the self purification part, and uh, they took the action as well. But then, uh, after several efforts of uh, taking actions, uh, when they were not able to get justice, they were compelled to sign the treaty. And uh, I don't think that it was good to sign that that treaty because uh, since those treaties were signed, even at present, we will get to hear a lot of news about uh, places of being Nepal colonized by India. Uh, India actually is claiming that uh, Lumbini, I hope you are aware that Gautam Buddha was born in Nepal, right? Professor, could you hear me? What was what was burning? Uh, uh, Gautam Buddha, light of Asia. Oh, okay. Buddha. So he was born in Nepal, but then uh, we get to uh, we get to hear a lot of news stating that uh, Gautam Buddha was born in India. India is claiming that the birthplace of Nepal. Uh, the birthplace of Gautam Buddha, which is called Kapil Vastu Lumbini, it is of India, and uh, we are not ready for that. And even uh, China, it is claiming that uh, Sagarmatha, Mount Everest, is of China. Uh, we we won't be <laughs> ready to accept that at any cost because we know that uh, 
uh, Mount Everest falls in Nepal, not only Nepal is aware of this, but the entire world is aware of this, right? So actually Mount Everest is, the, is, uh, the, um, is like a border between in Nepal and China. And uh, so, I mean, uh, because uh, Nepal agreed to sign uh, treaties um, following these non-violent campaigns principles, I think that uh, right now we are uh, going through a lot of uh, stops related to those, I guess. Okay, good. I mean, that's important, the legacy. Um, you live with the history, so it's important to get things right. That's why practical wisdom is so difficult and so important. Um, Samantha. Hi, Professor. Hi. We'll give you one second. I think that what I've taken away the most was when I was looking at the quotes on the sheet, the one that stood out to me most was talking about the Bible and the um, basically the faulty reasoning to use to justify slavery. And I found it very fascinating to me because a lot of the language, I love history, just putting that out there. A lot of the language used by the colonists, especially the colonists of the gentry class uh, towards Great Britain was, we're being enslaved by the British and so on and so forth. And I think that was one of the things that when I was reading a book in history recently, it was kind of the years in between um, the Articles of Federation and the Constitution and one thing that found me fascinating was the use of the rhetoric at the same time in the idea of being imprisoned and enslaved by the British that were under the royal thumb of the crown and all this stuff like that. But then the basic, um, just ridiculous at some point that they knew what they were doing wrong. And a lot of the founding fathers knew what they were doing wrong, including Jefferson, if you read some of his personal writings with um, their thoughts towards slavery. So I think when I saw that, um, when they were talking about the faulty yeah. reasoning and Martin Luther King, specifically in his letter to Birmingham jail that I remember reading when I was younger, just calling out the um, falsity of their arguments, I think was one of the biggest things that stood out to me. Yeah, actually the thing about history is that I taught intellectual history. That's what I like, what they were thinking. Mm -hmm. right but too many yeah. kids get history just what they're doing like who gives a rip right mm -hmm. so it really is amazing to me that you would teach history without teaching what they were thinking right no, I that's one of the things that I personally love about history is not only just the thought process of the people that created the constitution because in the first place the founding fathers I would say we're not necessarily the most democratic of people no. in the sense that our, the only reason why we have the first 10 amendments is because of the anti-federalists. If they were not, if they wouldn't have put their foot down and saying we're not signing this constitution, the most beloved rights that American citizens enjoy today would have not been in the constitution. And the fact that the only democratically elected position would have been a house representative and nobody else would have been elected by the people just shows how the system was never really made to be a democratic system in the first place. And so I think that's one of the things that I personally never understood the rhetoric over time about America, especially through many politicians of being basically a perfect democracy and we're the democracy that should shine light on the rest of the world because America in itself is not even a democracy. I mean, the way that it was supposed to be founded. And even to this day, there are a lot of checks and balances, which I think puts us more as a democratic republic than anything. And I think that not only does the, the quotes around slavery just show how um, ridiculous that they were just not noticing, and they knew what they were doing, it's just the ignoring of that issue could also be drawn to when we get into like Teddy Roosevelt with imperialism and the fact that America was founded on anti-imperialist thoughts and then turns around and just decides that we're gonna go and um, basically take over all these countries. I think the kind of time period and flow through history is fascinating to me and that's what I kind of- I'll have to show you the neoconservative statement about making the world safe for um, yeah. the American empire. That was written, what, in- 20, 30 years ago or something. It's a lot more yeah. than Teddy Roosevelt. Okay. Um, yeah. Let's see. Uh, yeah. The Declaration of Independence, the way they they demonized the Native Americans 
in order to say the British aren't protecting us from these barbarians, you know, it's just awful. And one um, thing that I, that's one of the things that I always found, uh, during basically the Americans had so many treaties with the Native Americans during the time period between the Articles of Federation and the Constitution, because they were, because there was a massive basically economic downturn, almost to the point where they saw it as close to the kind of Great Depression numbers. Nobody had any money. Gold and silver was very hard to come by. And it basically caused this massive economic downturn. And they were, the Americans, especially your um, governors of states, were severely afraid of not only the farmers and the farm farmers uprising, and that's why you everybody knows about Shays Rebellion, but also um, the, in, the Native Americans. And I think that's one thing that just gets lost to history, that a lot of them did, a lot of those tribes held a lot of power back then. And you can um, even see that in some of the older um, texts and documents about basically the fear that they had because they understood the power they had. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to cut you off, but I do want the other students to think about in their own countries, right? I want you to see analogies, right? So in your own countries, do you read about what the people were thinking about? And then as opposed to what they presented themselves to, to the public. So you learn about rhetoric, right? You learn about how powerful it is. Um, okay, um, let's go with somebody from AUW. I think my machine has um, all the uh, Lion students first. So let me do um, Untari. Do you have any comments just based on what we've been saying? I guess. Um, Shraboni, do you have something? Okay. No, Professor. Okay. Do you have a comment? Did you read it and come with something to say? Could not, Professor, because last night I did not have electricity because of the rain. Okay. Okay. Uh, Blaine, go ahead. I just want to make sure AUW students um, are, you know, not marginalized. That's the main thing. Okay. Uh, professor. Yeah. Uh, Untari wants to write whatever she wants to say right. via the chat right. box. So. Yep. So. Um, Do you want me to wait for a second or? Let's see that. Sure. Kasturi. No, uh, I think Blaine, he can go ahead and uh, okay. we can read out uh, the a thing that Undari writes it afterwards. Yeah, okay, go ahead, Blaine. Okay, so uh, side note, um, interesting thing, uh, I share a birthday with MLK Jr. Oh. Um, so, yeah, I, MLK is, <laughs> I, I like him. Well, actually, cool. you know, ML, Martin Luther King was shot the day after my 16th birthday and we were celebrating with the cake and the ice cream, so, okay. Um, but yeah, I liked how, um, like the comparisons with like, um, like MLK, like the whole March, the civil rights movement, um, I like the comparisons with, um, Jesus and the Jews and like some of the, the battles and like the, the turn the other cheek thing, whenever Jesus was fighting the Romans. Um, and then I also, I had a question, um, that I didn't have enough time to like fully go down the rabbit hole, um. But all through, like, I was homeschooled for six years, um, and then I joined public school uh, coming into fifth grade. Um, I, I was halfway through fifth grade. Um, and through middle school and junior high and high school, like, all of my public education, they've really pushed the whole golden rule thing, the treat others the way you want to be treated. And, um, like, did that stem from the civil rights era? Like, how was that before? For the civil rights era because i feel like especially after that point um people were like hey you should probably treat people like they're people and with dignity and respect so they started teaching that everywhere i just wondered if that's where it all stemmed from well i know that after the 60s there were these curricula called teaching tolerance right it does that make sense is that kind of what you're getting at well like 
I guess my question is, um, like, before the civil rights era, I'm guessing that, especially since everything was so segregated, um, most people just, um, like, like they didn't teach the golden rule that much. Or if they did, it wasn't very in-depth and specific, I guess. But in, in my schooling, like, every step of the way, they pounded it in my head, like, Treat, people, treat others the way, the way you want to be treated. Treat people with the basic level of human decency and respect. Where did and you I feel go like to that, school? Well, I went, um, I went to public school at Conway High School. In Conway, and then I, uh, in high school, um, 11th and 12th grade, I went to ASMSA in Hot Springs. AS what? It's ASMSA, Arkansas oh, yeah. School for oh, Mathematics yeah. Sciences. And no, uh, I, I don't know, Blaine. I don't know if every school is like that or what. Um, I'm going to have to let the students go, but we will get back to this. So I'm not letting you off the hook. Um, the next class will be uh, AUW students reading their papers to each other. Um, if the Lions students want to join, we'll be there. Um, and and if they want to listen to the video, but but Lion is off right next week, and then Sunday and Tuesday. Yeah, no, that's you're off, and then the AUW. This is your you know midterm exam equivalent, and then you're off the week after that, I guess. So that's where we're at, and then we will get back and start working on women's rights. I even posted that. So um, have a good break, guys. I think everybody needs it. And I'll see the AUW students in the next class um, Sunday for them. Uh, what, is it Sunday? For, no, wait, it's Monday for them. Anyway, go ahead, whatever. <laughs> um.